James 4, beginning in verse 13. Go to now. And that's an expression that is designed to arrest attention. It's used just a few times in the Bible. I believe back in Ecclesiastes, it's used once and then here twice in James. And if you look in chapter 5, it helps you understand what it means. In chapter 5, verse 1, go to now, ye rich men. And then he skipped down to verse 4, the same passage here. He says, behold. Well, go to now is like saying, behold this. Stop and consider this. Right now. <laughs> go to this in your mind right now. <laughs> Go to now, ye that say, today or tomorrow, we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. Whereas you know not what shall be on the morrow. For what is your life? And I underline your. This is talking about human life on earth, what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. Yet people act like things are going to continue just like they are forever. Your human life is just like that. For that you ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. But now ye rejoice in your boastings. All such rejoicing is evil. Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Now I think that's a fitting passage for us to consider as we finish out the year and look forward to a new year. Um, this year went by like a vapor. In fact, so has my first 39 years of life. I'll be 40 in March. I'm more than halfway there. <laughs> of course, I, I look for the Lord to come any day. I don't think I'll make it to 70 or 80. I think the Lord will come. but. You never know uh, what could happen in a day. You don't know what a day may bring forth. So, but I think about just, you know, I'm about to be over the hill, as they say. Where is it gone? And the next however many years, if I, I may not even have another day, but you get the point. I mean, I think it'll go by, the older you get, it goes by quicker, doesn't it? I remember in school hearing old people say that, and I thought, what are you talking about? I think the bell is never going to ring. I'd sit there. I wouldn't listen to the teacher. I didn't care about any of that stuff. I wish I would have paid attention, but I didn't. But I'd look at that clock and say, please ring, bell ring, bell ring, and it just drug by. Now, it just, whew. from Sunday to Sunday for us, is like a day, really. I mean, a week goes by like a day. So our life is but a vapor. And if I live to be 100... That's still a vapor. Ms. Mary, 96, right? And she's doing better than all of us, by the way, as far as she is. She's got more energy than I do, I guarantee it. 96, and you would say, wouldn't you? Where is it going? Like a vapor. It goes by like a vapor. There's a lady at the nursing home over here we go to on Fridays, and she's 101. And uh, they'll tell you. You ask people, and, and by the way, it's wonderful to talk to people that have been around, you know, for a century. They've got a lot to say. <laughs> They've seen a lot of things. But it goes by so fast. So, but even if you live to be 100, what is that compared to eternity? Someone said, if a bird took a grain of sand off the earth, flew to the moon and dropped it and came back, by the time that bird took all the sand off this earth and transferred it to the moon, eternity's just getting started. <laughs> you can't measure it. Now, this passage said your life is a vapor. And then it also talks about this thing of making plans. You know, as we think about a new year, most people look forward to a new year. 
And uh, we think, boy, this is going to be the best year yet. And we have all these great plans that we never do, but we make them anyway. We feel good about it, you know. This is the year I'm finally going to get in shape. This is the year I'm finally going to, uh, you know, do this, that, and the other. And very rarely do we ever follow through. But we always look forward to a new year with anticipation. But in light of this passage, should we even make plans for the coming year? So there's a lot in here for us to consider. Now, James wrote this by inspiration of God to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad. I know that because that's what it says in chapter 1, verse 1. And so historically, it's the early Acts period. If you went back to Acts chapter 8, verse 1, it talks about how they were scattered out of Jerusalem because of the persecution. And so it's very early Historically speaking, in that Acts period, uh, the, the period, the transition period covered by the book of Acts, that historical book, but prophetically it jumps ahead, I believe, to the tribulation period. Because what we're living in right now is a parenthetical mystery age that was not revealed until after the fall of Israel in Acts 7. And the prophetic clock stopped concerning Israel. You know, Israel had rejected the Father throughout the Old Testament. They rejected the Son and His earthly ministry and crucified Him. They were given an opportunity as a nation to repent. The Holy Ghost, Christ baptized His disciples with the Holy Ghost and He came with power. And they did the signs and wonders of the kingdom and re-offered the kingdom to Israel. But as a nation, they rejected the Holy Ghost and fell, Christ warned about blaspheming the Holy Ghost, not being forgiven, and they fell as a nation when they stoned Stephen in Acts 7, a man filled with the Holy Ghost, and then God began to move away. He revealed the mystery of this age through his chosen vessel. He took Saul of Tarsus, saved him by exceeding abundant grace, and made him the apostle Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles, revealed a new gospel, a new ministry, revealed mysteries through him concerning building the body of Christ in this age of grace. But God's not finished with the nation Israel because when He's done building the body of Christ, He's going to catch us away and He's going to resume where He left off with Israel and bring them through tribulation. So what is said in that early Acts period still fits in the future tribulation period when they're going to be scattered abroad. And there's things in the book of James that unless you read it in light of the tribulation period, you're going to have a hard time with it. But it makes perfect sense when you put it in the proper context. So let me just briefly say a word on this passage in light of its dispensational and doctrinal context because James 4, 13 to 17 is familiar, but you rarely hear it dealt with dispensationally uh, in, in its proper context. And then, But for the bulk of the message, we want to look at some application, some spiritual applications that we can draw from the passage for us today. James warns against the evil of boasting in self-centered and presumptuous plans to get gain. Under the gospel of the kingdom, Christ taught his disciples they were not to even be concerned about material things. They weren't to be making plans about gain. In fact, they were to take what they had, sell it, give it to the poor, and follow Him, trusting Him to provide for the material needs. Look back in Luke 12. Keep a marker in James 4. I'm going to do this real quick. But let me just show you this. I tell you, when you look at this in light of its dispensational doctrinal context, it fits perfectly. But there are certainly things in it that still apply, and we'll look at that too. Luke chapter 12. Verse 13, And one of the company said unto him, Master, speak to my brother that he divide the inheritance with me. And he said unto him, Man, who made me a judge or a divider over you? He said unto them, Take heed and beware of covetousness. For a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. James said, What is your life? You know what the sad truth is for a lot of people? It's things. They can't be happy without things. But all those things will fade away. Our life is not to be wrapped up in things. It should be wrapped up in the truth and the Lord Jesus Christ and His Word. But anyway, he said, A man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, No regard for God, saying, What shall I do? Because I, 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 you see all the eyes in here. I have no room where to bestow my fruits. Well, if it wasn't for God, you wouldn't have any fruit. He said, this will I do. 
I will pull down my barns and build greater. And there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, oh, really, you made it, did you? I'll say to my soul, soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, thou fool. This night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then whose shall those things be which thou hast provided? You're going to leave it all. A rich man died. Someone said, I wonder what he left. Uh, and the fellow he was talking to said, well, he left it all. <laughs> You're going to leave it all behind. You can't take it with you. You're going to leave it for your family to fight over. Or you're not going to leave anything. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do my family a favor. I'm not going to leave them anything. All right. Anyway. <laughs> Except for the, the truth, right? <laughs> so is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. He said unto his disciples, Therefore I say unto you, Take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat, neither for the body, what ye shall put on. The life is more than meat. The body is more than raiment. Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap, which neither have storehouse nor barn, and God feedeth them. How much more are ye better than the fowls? By the way, compare that in, in Proverbs 6, and we may look at that if we have time later, but he said, consider the ant, you sluggard. <laughs> and the ant is industrious and makes plans, you know, and lays up in store, and uh, there's a lesson to be learned there. Well, in the context of the kingdom being at hand, they were to be like the raven, not the ant. But we need to be like the ant, not the raven. <laughs> In other words, God's telling these people when the kingdom's at hand, you don't have to worry about one thing. The kingdom's about to appear, and I'm going to take care of you till then. You don't even have to think about what you're going to do as far as these things are concerned. But that's not the context you and I live in. Uh, Paul said the parents ought to lay up for the children. And it's okay to lay up and have savings as long as you uh, are a giver and you trust in God and not in your riches. But he said this, verse 25, Which of you taking thought can add uh, to a statue one cubit? If ye then be not able to do that thing which is least, why take ye thought for the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They toil not, and they spin not. And yet I say unto you that Solomon in all his glory is not arrayed like one of these. If God so clothe the grass which is today in the field, and tomorrow is cast in the oven, how much more shall, uh, will he clothe you, O ye of little faith? And seek not that ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, neither be of a doubtful mind. For all these things do the nations of the world seek after, and your Father knoweth that ye have need of these things. So don't even think about these things. Seek after these things. Notice what he says in verse 31. But rather seek ye the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. Hey, the kingdom's about to come. You're going to have all these things and more. So what do you do in the meantime? Fear not, little flock. It's your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. That's the context. They're looking for the kingdom to come. Sell that you have. Give alms. Provide yourselves bags which wax not old, a treasure in the heavens that faileth not, where no thief approacheth, neither moth corrupteth. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And the kingdom of heaven is coming down to the earth. They're to lay up treasure in heaven, that, but they'll enjoy the reward on earth when the kingdom comes. Let your loins be girded about and your lights burning and ye yourselves like unto men that wait for their Lord when he shall return from the wedding that when he cometh and knocketh they may open unto him immediately. Blessed are those servants whom the Lord when he cometh shall find watching. Verily I say unto you that he shall gird himself and make them to sit down to meet and will come forth and serve them. And if he shall come in the second watch or come in the third watch and find them so blessed are those servants. And this know that if the good men of the house had known what hour the thief would come he would have watched and not have suffered his house to be broken through, be ye therefore ready also, for the Son of Man cometh at an hour when you think not. You see the point? Hey, he's about to come. The kingdom's going to come. I mean, the kingdom's at hand. They're to be watching. That's the attitude. Not going into a city for a year to get gain. <laughs> they're to sell out. They're, they're to follow him. He's going to provide and then the kingdom will come. And they'll have more than enough in the kingdom of heaven. That's the context. All right, so back in James 4, if they truly believed the king was at hand, they would sell out. They would trust the Lord to provide. 
In James 5, verse 8, it says, Be also patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. That's talking about the second coming of Christ. That's what they're looking at. It's not talking about the rapture here. This is not written to the body of Christ in the age of grace. This is written to the twelve tribes scattered abroad, historically in the Acts period and prophetically in the tribulation period. Well, you know what? That's why <laughs> everything James says about rich men is bad. According to James, if you're rich, you're evil. I mean, you see that in James 1.11, he said um, that the sun is no sooner risen with a burning heat, but it withereth the grass, and the flower thereof falleth, and the grace of the fashion of it perisheth, so shall the rich man fade away in his ways. In chapter 2, verse 5, Hearken, my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith? They believe the gospel of the kingdom. They're rich in faith. That's why they sold out and they're poor in this world. And heirs of the kingdom, which he hath promised to them that love them, but ye have despised the poor. Do not rich men oppress you and draw you before the judgment seats? Look in chapter 5, verse 1. Go to now, ye rich men, weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. Your riches are corrupted, your garments are moth-eaten, your gold and silver is cankered, and the rust of them shall be a witness against you and shall eat your flesh as it were fire. Ye have heaped treasure together for the what? Last days. The last days of prophecy concerning the 70th week of Daniel, the second coming. So according to James, if you're rich, because you're evil... Now, Paul said, um, hey, charge them that are rich that they trust not in their riches. He didn't say they couldn't be rich. He just said, don't love money. You can be rich materially in the age of grace and be right with God. But under the gospel of the kingdom, if you were rich, you obviously weren't right with God because you didn't believe the kingdom was at hand. And look, folks, Jesus said, sell all that ye have. That was not saying, it would be a good idea if you, if you think about it. He told them to do it or they could not be his disciple. Now, notice again in James 4, verse 13. What do they want to do? They want to buy and sell. If you know the Bible, there, there ought to be a verse that comes to your mind. If you understand right division, you understand the difference between prophecy and mystery, and you understand James is written concerning prophecy, that phrase, buy and sell, shows up in Revelation 13, 17, that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. He said, you people, you're worried about buying and selling and getting gain, you're going to take the mark and go to hell is what you're going to do. He's warning them. Okay? That's what's going on here in the context, dispensationally and doctrinally and so on. But is there truth here for us today? Is there truth in what James said for us today? Uh, there certainly is. In fact, there's truth all through the epistle of James for us today. For an example, look in chapter 1, verse 11. Excuse me, not verse 11. Look in chapter 1, verse number 8. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Is that true today? <laughs> certainly is. Verse 13, let no man say when he is tempted, I'm tempted of God. God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. When lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin when it is finished, bringeth forth death. That's a tremendous passage in understanding temptation and sin and how all that works. How about verse 17? Every good gift, every perfect gift is from above, cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom there's no variableness. Neither shadow of turning. That's true. God doesn't change in His attributes. How about, um, how about for an example, I'm just giving you a few examples here. Chapter 2, verse 8. If you fulfill the royal law according to the Scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, you do well. Are we supposed to love our neighbors ourselves? Well, Paul seemed to think so in Romans 13 and Galatians 5 for an example. What about uh, chapter 3, verse 8? How about this one? Uh, the tongue can no man tame. It's an unruly evil full of deadly poison. Is that not true today? Uh, you, can't, you can't get control of your tongue. You need the Holy Spirit. You need, in Ephesians 4, he talked about walking in the new man. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. That comes by the Spirit of God and the new man. That old man can't tame his own tongue. And then, by the way, at the end of chapter 3, he contrasts 
God's wisdom with the wisdom of the world, and there's some wonderful applications in there for us. How about in chapter 4, where he said in verse number 6, He giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, and giveth grace unto the humble. That's true. You, you, you can't get saved in this age of grace if you, in your pride, think you can earn it. What do you have to do? Humble yourself and say, I need a Savior. That's true today. And by the way, as a Christian, if you walk in pride, you, you, God's not going to strengthen you if you don't depend on Him. In verse number 10, He said, Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, He shall lift you up. That's a moral principle. So when we come to this passage here, in verses 13 to 17, there's certainly things we can apply. Now look, here's the thing. Making plans is not evil. But leaving God out and boasting in your plans is. Do you understand? Making plans is wise. Proverbs 6 talk, tells the sluggard to look at the ant and, see, and, and learn a lesson from the ant and, and preparation and planning. And they don't even have an overseer. And uh, it's wise to make some plans and so on. But it's one thing to make plans. It's something else to be presumptuous and, and boast in your plans. And what you're going to do without any regard to what God has to say about it. Boast not thyself a tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. That's Proverbs 27.1. You don't know what's going to happen even today, much less tomorrow. You're going to boast yourself in tomorrow? You, don't need, you could die today. You may not have a tomorrow. That's true. And it's not wrong for us to get gain so long as gain doesn't get us. <laughs> in other words, so long as we don't love money. 1 Timothy 6, the love of money is the root of all evil. Uh, having food and raiment be content. Uh, godliness is great gain. He said, charge them that are rich that they be not... Uh, high-minded nor trusted uncertain riches but in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy and that they be rich in good works and that they are givers in other words not trusting in their riches trusting in God and using the riches as good stewards for the Lord's work I mean so it's okay in this age to get gain it's okay to make plans but we should not be full of ourselves and act like it's our life now what is your life you say, it's my life okay what is it your life is a vapor my life is a vapor. What is that to boast in? That woman told King David, and I'm not going to go back and look at the passage and get into all the context of it, but about his son Absalom and how he was keeping him banished. And uh, that woman came in. She was put up to it to go tell some things to King David. But that woman said to King David, she said, we're like water spilt on the ground that can't be gathered up. There's an old saying that says, you want to know how much you're going to be missed when you die? Put your hand in a bucket of water, pull it out, and as long as it takes for that hole to close, that's about how long you're going to be missing this world. Your life. Yeah, what is your life? It's a vapor. You better live God's life. You better think about who you are in Christ. That's eternal. But he said, you know, the right attitude is if the Lord will. If the Lord will, verse 15, for that you ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. Now, what about that? Is that, is that something for today? Paul seemed to think it was. Look back in Acts 18. I'm going to show you. This is very important to see. Paul's the greatest example in the Bible of this principle. Notice all the things he says about this. In Acts 18, verse 21. See, I say, Lord willing. And some people would actually try to rebuke me for that. And say, well, God's not in control of your daily life. Well, look, God lets me make choices. I understand that. And I'm not a Calvinist. And I don't think everything is predetermined and all of that. But I know this. I can't take my next breath without God. You got this arrogant attitude. You think it's just what you're going to do when you want to do it. And you got the wrong attitude, my friend. That's not how Paul was. In Acts 18, 21, he bade them farewell saying, I must by all means keep this. And he's not doing this for religious purposes. He's not trying to keep the feast because he thinks he has to to be right with God. That's not it at all. But the point is this. I must keep this feast that cometh in Jerusalem, but I will return again unto you if God will. 
And he sailed from Ephesus. If God will. Look at Romans 1. Romans 1. You ought to mark these references down. It's very important because what this proves is Paul believed God was involved in his daily life. That he couldn't live another day. He couldn't get from point A to point B without God. He wouldn't even want to travel without saying, God willing, I'll get there. Romans chapter 1, verse number 10. He said, making a request of by any means, now at length I might have a prosperous journey by the will of God to come unto you. And then at the end of the epistle, in chapter 15, verse 23, um, excuse me, verse 32 is what I want. That I may come unto you with joy by the will of God. He's planning to get to Rome. If it's the will of God. Look please in 1 Corinthians 4. Verse 19. Well verse 18 he said, Now some are puffed up as though I would not come to you. you think I, he said, you think I'm just blowing smoke? <laughs> you think I'm just running my mouth? I'll come to tell you to your face is what he's saying. And then he said, But I will come to you shortly. If the Lord will. If the Lord will, look in chapter 16, one more place. Chapter 16. Now this is very important. See, if you, get, if you get wrong in your doctrine, it affects how you live your life. And if you think that God is not involved in your daily life at all, you've got the wrong attitude, you're going to walk in pride is what you're going to end up doing. That, and that's not good. You ought to say every day, Lord, I'm a, I want to honor you. I want to glorify you. And this is what I plan to do. But only, I need you, Lord, if it's your will. That's the right attitude. Notice, beginning in verse 1, Paul's talking about these plans. Now, concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye, upon the first day of the week... Let every one of you lay by them in store. The implication is they would be meeting the first day of the week, and when they would meet together, they were going to take up this collection so that when Paul came, he could take it and go uh, for the poor saints in Jerusalem is the offering he's talking about in particular. Um, and, but there's a principle here about giving. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by them in store as God hath prospered him. We ought to give according to how God's prospered. By the way, as God hath prospered him. Do you ever think about that? Did Paul think God somehow was involved with what we have? Isn't it God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy? Some arrogant fool will say, Well, I work for this money. You couldn't get out of bed without God. You wouldn't have a job to go to. You wouldn't have money to make. You wouldn't have the health to work a job without God. You ought to get on your knees every day and thank God you can do anything. For in Him we live and breathe and move and have our being. As God hath prospered him, let there be no gatherings when I come. Notice, and when I come, whomsoever you shall approve by your letters, then will I send him to bring your liberality in Jerusalem. He's, <laughs> that's a little uh, psychology there. He said, you're going to take up an offering that's going to be liberal. I'm going to take your liberality. He's, he's giving him a little hint. You ought you to give generously is what he's saying. And if, I be, and if it be meet that I go also, they shall go with me. So he's making all these plans. Now I will come unto you when I pass through Macedonia, for I do pass through Macedonia, and it may be that I will abide, yea, in winter with you, that ye may bring me on my journey. There's another little hint. You need to help me get to where I'm going. <laughs> bring me on my journey whithersoever I go, for I will not see you now by the way, but I trust to tarry a while with you if the Lord permit but I'll tarry at Ephesus until Pentecost for a great door and effectual is open to me. How's that so if God doesn't work in our life? You believe God opens doors for you? Gives you opportunities? That He'll prosper you? That He will get you to where you're going? Paul seemed to think all of that. Maybe he wasn't as spiritual as some of the brethren are. <laughs> or maybe he was a lot more. <laughs> Uh, there are people out there that say because God's not doing signs and wonders today, He's not doing anything. And when you pray, the only thing you ought to do is tell God what His Word says. You think God needs you to tell Him what His Word says? 
He wants you to believe what it says <laughs> and live by what it says. Prayer makes a difference. If it didn't make a difference, why did Paul keep saying pray for me? And why did he tell Philemon, I'm trusting through your prayers. I'm going to get out of jail and come see you. So go ahead and prepare a lodging for me. I'm following Paul's example. Okay, that's who I'm trying to follow. Not, I don't, it doesn't matter what I say or another preacher says, what saith the Scripture? If the Lord permit. Now this is vital. God is involved in our daily lives. Otherwise, everything Paul said about God willing, if God permit, that wouldn't make any sense if God wasn't involved. Now just because God is not orchestrating every little detail, and just because everything is not predetermined, doesn't mean He's not involved. People go from one extreme to the other. Now, go back please to... Um, Psalm. Go back please to Psalm 39. There's a couple things I'm trying to get across to us today. We can make some plans as long as we depend on the Lord and our plans are in line with His Word. But I'm going to tell you what, that ought to be the case because your life is a vapor and every day you spend doing your will instead of God's will, it's a total waste. Everything needs to be in accordance with God's will for it to matter and for it to be lasting. And I'm not going to run all these references, but there's a bunch of especially in Job. He talks about our life, our earthly life. Look, basically what James is doing is he's reminding us our life is short and only doing God's will is what matters. <laughs> When it's all said and done. You're talking about life being short. Job compares it to a lot of different things. Even like the wind that passes away. I mean you can go back to Job. and In fact in Job he said. Man that is born of woman. That would be all of us correct? Is a few days. Full of trouble. And he goes on to say in that passage. Our life is like a. It's like a, like a flower that pops up and goes away. It's like a shadow. Just a shadow. But here in Psalms, let me give you a few in Psalms. Psalm 39, verse 4. Lord, make me to know mine end. And the measure of my day. Yet people don't want to think about that. They don't want to face the, the reality they're going to die. Now I'm still looking for the Lord to come. And, and there are going to be believers alive on the earth when He comes that won't die. But you better be prepared just in case He died before He comes. And you need to think about the fact that our life on this earth will not continue on and on and on, that there is an end. The measure of my days, what it is, that I may know how frail I am. You think you're strong? I mean, you can be healthy and, and strong, you think, and you, you could slip. You could slip and die. You're that frail. I'm talking about a healthy young man can fall and hit his head the wrong way and he's gone. I read about a, a butcher who was messing around trying to play a prank on a friend and he, put a lot, he was putting a lot of pepper on his meat and he was going to do it as a joke, but he, was, he had so much pepper it caused him to sneeze so hard he blew a blood vessel and died. I mean, you're a frail. I'm frail. This flesh is weak. He said, Behold, thou hast made my days as an hand breadth. You know what that is from here to here. Look at that. There it is. That's not very long. That's your days. Mine age is as nothing before thee. Ever, verily, every man at his best state, you living the best you can in your flesh, living your way, is altogether vanity. That means empty and nothing. See, law. That means stop and think on that. Surely every man walketh in a vain show. Surely they are disquieted in vain. He heapeth up riches, and knoweth not who shall gather them. You know what this passage is saying? It's, it's saying your human life is frail, brief, and vain. How's that for your ego? That is the Word of God, and that's still true today. There, I'm going somewhere with all this. Hang with me. Go please to uh, Psalm 78. Psalm 78, verse 39. He remembered that they were but flesh. And what is that flesh? A wind. 
that passeth away and cometh not again. You're out there in the yard working, and a breeze comes. Boy, that's nice. It don't last very long, though, does it? It just, whew, and it's gone. That's, that's your flesh. Look, please, in Psalm 90. We did it for our Scripture reading, but a couple things in there. He talked about how God is from everlasting to everlasting. And that for God, a thousand years is like yesterday. <laughs> but then he said, you know what we are? He said, we're like grass in verse 5. That grows up in the morning it flourisheth and groweth up. In the evening it's cut down and withereth. All flesh is as grass and all the glory of man is the flower of grass. The, the grass withereth and the flower fadeth away. But the word of the Lord endureth forever. It says that in Isaiah 40 and Peter quotes it in 1 Peter 1. But notice what he said. He said... Verse 10, that our days, the, the, the average lifespan is 70. And if you, if you make it to 80, you got some strength, but the problem is you're not going to enjoy it too much. Now, I'm just telling you what the Bible says. And you folks over 70 would agree with that. It's not, it, it, it gets harder. And I, I've heard people say all the time, getting old is not for sissies. It's hard to get old. And I've heard people say those things. And I'm fearful because I already feel terrible and I'm only 39 years old. <laughs> What's coming my way, man? But here's the thing about it. He said, it is soon cut off and we fly away. Death does not end at all. Your soul goes somewhere. If you're saved, it goes to be with the Lord. If it's lost, it goes to hell. But you're going to fly, you're going to leave this earth. But what's the point of all this? Verse 12, teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. Look, we don't like facing the reality that life is short. That's just a vapor. It's like a wind. It's a shadow. It's like grass. It's this and that. Man, you know, but the good thing is you realize I don't want to waste my time. It's so short, I want to do something that's going to last forever. I want to live in such a way that's eternal. I don't want to live in such a way that it completely fades away and it's gone and means nothing. Think about it. Here's the, here's the point of all this. And there's so many references. I'm just giving this to you. You can run all kind of references along this theme. But here's the main thing. We could die any day. The Lord could come any day. Paul said, wake out of sleep, knowing the time. Now it's high time. The Lord's going to appear. It could be today. You don't have another day guaranteed to you. Whether you die or the Lord comes, we don't know. Our earthly life is short. So here's the point. We've got to redeem the time. We've got to redeem the time. That means quit wasting it. Buy it up and use it wisely. How do you redeem the time? Ephesians 5, when he talked about redeeming the time, he said, understanding what the will of the Lord is. When you know what the will of the Lord is and you seek to be filled with His Spirit so you can accomplish the will of the Lord, then you're getting somewhere and the will of God is revealed in the Word of God. What God is doing in this age is revealed in Paul's epistles. You need to know what that is and live in light of it. You need to live your life each day in line with what God is doing. Your life. Listen, don't let me lose you. I, I tell you, I can go, I could preach 10 hours on this. I'm not going to. <laughs> but listen... Your life, my life, is nothing. But here's the good news. To live is Christ and to die is gain. Here's the good news. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For you're dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. Now, if Christ is your life and He is if you're saved, you need to act like that. And you need to live by the will of God for the eternal things that matter. We have life in Christ that is eternal. Everything I do just in, for self fades away. But whatever I do in the will of God, that's eternal. And the thing is, I'm not saying you have to be a preacher of the gospel. I mean, we all need to share the gospel with others. But you don't have to be a full-time minister or whatever. Whatever you do in life, you do it for the glory of God and use it as an opportunity to get His Word out. And you can serve God in whatever your job is. You serve God and live for eternal things. Souls are eternal. There is eternal heaven and hell. Live with that in view. Live with the judgment seat of Christ in view. We're going to be rewarded for our labor eternally. Okay, so it makes a difference how we live as a Christian. 
But let me finish up with this thought. He said, therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Now let me challenge you on this. If it, look, it is good to sincerely say from your heart and mean it, if the Lord will. I want God's will. Alright? That's the good way to live. That's why Paul said, um, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service, and be not conformed to this world, but be it transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. The will of God is revealed in the Word of God to us for this age. It's in Paul's epistles in particular, the specific things God is doing today, who you are in the body of Christ, how to live in such a way as to glorify Him. You can be filled with the knowledge of His will. You don't have to go find the will of God. It's been revealed in the Word of God. You need to believe it and you need to live by it. It's good to live that way. Well, if you know to do good and do it not, then you're living in sin. Now, here's the thing. Most, a lot of Christians think, well, I don't go out and get drunk. I haven't killed anybody. Well, oh man, I haven't murdered anybody. But praise the Lord, you ought to get an award for that. That's how people say that stuff, though. I'm a good person, you know. I hadn't done this. I hadn't done that. I hadn't done the other thing. What are you doing? What are your Christian life is not about what you don't do. The Christian life is about who you are in Christ and walking in the Spirit. And if you do that, you automatically aren't going to do the wrong things. But here's the thing. It's possible to stop doing some wrong things and still not be right with God. In, as far as practically speaking, in other words, it's not enough just to be a good person. You need to be spiritual. You need to live for eternal things. You need to walk in the Holy Spirit. And God saved us. He said in Ephesians 2, He said... By grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, creating Christ Jesus unto what? Good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. We're to walk in good works. Paul said, abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good. It's not enough just to hate evil. You need to cleave to that which is good. Are you doing good, living a good life, and that only comes? In my flesh dwells no good thing. So the only way I can live a good life is by the Spirit of God, in the Word of God. It's not enough to put off the old man. You've got to put on the new. You understand that? Now, when you got saved, God took you out of the old man. He put you in the new. But how we live, we need to put off the deeds of the old man, put on the deeds of the new. All right? It is good to walk in the Spirit. Not just to say, well, I'm saved and on my way to heaven. Daily walk in the Spirit by the Word of God. Living your life on the basis of the Word of God. Through the power of God. For the glory of God. Okay, is it good to study the Bible? Well, it must be because the Bible said, Study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman needeth not to be ashamed. Rightly dividing the Word of truth. You don't study your Bible this year. It's a sin to neglect the Word of God. Uh, do you think it's good to pray? Oh, it's good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, 1 Timothy 2. You neglect prayer, it's sin. Samuel said to Israel, God forbid that I should sin in ceasing to pray for you. Prayerlessness is sin. You think it's good and God's will to be part of a church family? Notice I didn't just say church attendance. A lost person can attend church. But when you're plugged in and it's a part of your... Look, you, you have relationships. You're serving God with other believers. You're faithful to it. Your heart is in it. You can be sitting in a chair every Sunday and not be doing that which is good because it's not... You're not doing it for the right reasons. You're not really part of it. Be part of a church family in 2020. Don't just attend the service. You think it's good to give? <laughs> If any, uh, Paul taught a lot about giving. He said, do good to those, to all men, especially those of the household of faith. I'm about giving in, in Galatians 6 and other passages. So if we don't give, look, did the verse say that it's a sin to know to do good and don't do it? Do you know what that means? It's not just the wrong things you commit that are sin. It's the good things you fail to do is sin. When you know what's right and you don't do it, you sinned. Now think about that. That's a pretty high standard, isn't it? But that's what the Bible says. The sins of omission. 
are just as sinful as the sins of commission. And so the challenge is, as we look forward to a new year, don't leave God out. Live your life in His will. Depend on Him and do the good things He's given us to do. Lay hold on eternal life. That's what Paul told Timothy. He said in chapter 6, twice he said, lay hold on eternal life. See, you have eternal life if you're saved, but you need to act like it. Folks, your life is not going to continue like it is. It, it's, things change quickly, but one day you're going to take your last breath or the Lord's going to come. Either way, it's a vapor. If I were to write, and the board's over there, I'm not going to take the time to pull it over here just for this, but if I were to write on the board, 1980, that was the year I was born, 1980. And then let's say I make it three score and ten, you know, 70, that'd be 2050. So I put 1980, 2050, and there's a dash, and that's what your life is, that little dash right there. But the good news is if you give the gospel, if you get the word of God out, the word of the Lord endureth forever. The, the, your, your, all you do for yourself is like a flower that pops up and falls over. But what you do for eternity, what you do for the, wor the, the work of the Lord and giving the gospel and giving the truth of God's word, what you do, that abideth forever. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. All that's in this world is the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. The Bible says that's not of the Father, it's of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But the will of God, that abideth forever, right? And so we need to live with eternity in view. And say, alright, another year's gone. It's like a vapor. All right, I got, maybe I'll have 2020. Maybe I won't. I got to live with that reality. There ought to be a sense of urgency. I don't want to waste my time. I want to redeem the time. And it's not just, well, I don't do this anymore and I don't do that anymore. What are you doing it, positively going in the right direction in the Lord's work? Serving the Lord. That's the question. And by the way, when I say sins of omission are just as sinful as sins of commission, in some cases they're worse. You know what's going to send people to hell? Not one sin they commit will send anybody to hell. It's what they omit. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. If you omit the believing, if you hear the gospel and you don't believe it, that unbelief will put you in hell if you die in that condition. So you get saved by believing on what Christ has already done. He died for all of your sins, was buried and rose again. It's all taken care of. Put your trust in Him. And guess what? Don't get excited or anything, you know. You have eternal life as a present possession. But lay hold on it. Live like you do. Do the will of God. The will of God abides forever. What is your life? Well, your life, my life, it's just a little vapor. But I have eternal life in the Lord. To live is Christ and to die is gain. Let's stand together if you would please.